All right, Simon, welcome. Uh, I'm, I've been friends with you for ages. Thank you so much for your time. I, I've been lucky to actually see this presentation before, a few months ago. Simon gave a little improve, did a little presentation to about 10 of us online, and he actually gave us this indigo <laughs> denim history presentation then, and I remember seeing it, and he only talked for about 10 minutes, and I went, this is such a great presentation, and all our students across the world would benefit for us to, to hear it again. So, Simon, I'm going to switch my camera off and I'm going to give the opera, give the give the the mic to you. But thank you so much for like sort of joining us. Simon's from Candiani Mills. Thank you so so much for like for like joining. Thank us. you, Mozin. Well, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for for having me and for having this uh, brief talk about denim history. Um, I'm from Candiani. I'm not going to talk about Candiani or our mill. I'm going to share with you a little bit the history uh, that we've been researching for years um, about denim. And um, that's basically what I'm here for. So let me share my screen. It's a brief history about denim. And it's quite surprising. It was very surprising for us as well, because we came across that um, by moving around in our territory. You see um, the map of Northern Italy here. You see clearly Milano, you see Chieri, you see Genova. Uh, Milano is actually where we're from. The sea right next to Milano is where the mill is based. We started here in 1938 and we're still producing 100% of our fabrics here. So the interesting thing is that um, we're starting to talk about the 12th century. So in the 11th century, there was a... Um, a um, a movement called the Qatars. The Qatars were a Christian Gnostic movement between the 12th and 14th century, and they had to flee from what today is Bulgaria, and they migrated all the way from Bulgaria through Northern Italy to, um, to what today is Spain. And they brought with themselves the knowledge of wood and of weaving. And so basically they stopped through Milan and then they had a long stop in Chieri. And in Chieri, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that they uh, really shared the knowledge about woad dyeing, uh, woad growing and woad dyeing and, um, and weaving. So basically uh, in Chieri in the 12th, 13th and 14th century, they already had a university of Fustain. Fustain was that first fabric that they started to weave there was a workwear fabric. And matter of fact, in Chieri, there's a textile museum that I invite you all to go visit because it's really uh, fascinating because they have in those books, in those university books from the 12th, 13th and 14th century, they, they speak about uh, Fustain and the definition of Fustain. Fustain was basically a two by one fabric compared to the three by one construction that you have in modern denim. And it wasn't indigo dyed, but it was woad dyed. And they didn't dye the warp, which is basically the vertical yarn, but they dyed the weft. So um, what happened is actually that this, uh, this first workwear fabric was, uh, was, was used, um, was actually used throughout Europe because woad was actually just like ham, as Mosin said before, uh, woad was growing everywhere. So you didn't need like particular um, uh, watering systems or chemicals to grow it. It was very easy to grow it. Matter of fact, like it spread throughout Europe and it was grown um, even in Scotland, like throughout the whole Europe. Matter of fact, it was the way to dye textiles blue. When we talk about dyeing though, there is a, um, there's a term called uh, tinctorial affinity, which means how well does that color, that dye stuff, stick to cotton? In the case of woad, it doesn't really stick well to cotton. So you have a very light blue, which is the big difference that its, um, its brother, let's say indigo, um, makes better. Like indigo sticks better to cotton, so you have a deeper blue, but that comes later on. Matter of fact, like in the 15th century in Milan, at that time, Leonardo da Vinci was based in Milan and he was working for the um, for the Scala, um, which was the family in uh, excuse me, not the Scala, the Sforza, which was the the reigning family in Milan at that time, and uh, last year in 2019, it was the 500 years anniversary of um, 
of uh, Leonardo da Vinci and they re-edited the Codex Atlanticus, which is basically a collection of works that he's written. And um, on page 985, basically, uh, they show that he has actually designed the first shuttle loom, which we're talking about semi-automatic shuttle loom. The thing is actually it's never been realized because after that he had to flee to France and uh, the first semi-automatic shuttle loom was built 200 years later in England for the first time. And uh, in that time, 15th century, Vasco da Gama, which was a, um, was a sailor and, uh, and a trader, so basically he opened up a um, new uh, trading route between India and Europe and he facilitated the import of indigo. So indigo was already present, but it was not dominant. So indigo started to flow into, uh, through Genova into Europe. And the thing is that they discovered that it just died much better. As I said before, it died deeper than actually woad. So a lot of people wanted to switch from woad to indigo, but the whole, it was a whole industry, woad industry laid out throughout Europe. So there was a a very interesting historical factor was a blue revolution. So it was even banned for some time called the, the color of the devil and, and so on. But eventually it actually just made it through because it was uh, so much better as a dye stuff. And um, at that time, uh, denim fabric appears in, in two parts, in Nîmes and in Genova. So um, in Nîmes, you would have a fabric called Serge de Nîmes, and uh, basically was a wool dyed twill made initially of wool, but then it was mixed with hot cotton and hemp. Um, there was a lot of hemp in the early days of denim production because it was just so simple to grow everywhere, as Mosin said before. And it was very resistant, more resistant than cotton. So at the beginning it was hemp and was hemp mixed with cotton because it had a, it fulfilled the purpose of long lasting workwear. In Genova at that time, they were using those fabrics from Chieri and they started to produce them in the Genoa area as well. So it was an indigo dyed warp and a white weft. So at that time, it reached already a three by one construction. So it was the fabric that we know today, basically. And it was worn by sailors and by all the people working in the port area. And the fascinating thing is that um, they would export uh, this fabric from Genova to mostly England, because at that time, that's a long story, but like there was a, um, there was a, a drought. And so basically, um, agriculturally speaking, there was more cotton grown. And uh, at that time, it lowered the price of, of, uh, of hemp and, um, and cotton. And so basically at that time, that fabric that was exported from Genoa was cheaper, so in England it was consumed more. The fact, the fun fact is that on every roll they would use to print, to stamp basically the name of the origin of that roll. And when you look at Genoa, how it was written back in the days, it was written uh, G E N E S, genus. So the English would say genes. So the word genes comes actually from the word Genoa while denim comes from nim which stands for denim from nim these are the two basically um the, where the names come from very interesting is what is the is the the things that you can still find in genoa so here we're looking at a uh, tapestry and uh, that was used in uh, 1538 basically to decorate a chapel within a basilica where pilgrims would go during the Eastern time. And uh, ever since 1538, they would be exhibited every year in that, in that chapel until they disappeared something like 100 years ago and then they just uh, got rediscovered. And now you can go visit and see them in the Museo Diocesano in Genoa. And it's for someone like us, this is, uh, it's amazing because um, it's actually, denim fabric as we know it, and it's indigo dyed, and it's painted with a white color called biacca, <clears throat> which is exactly what we're doing today with laser technology. So it's pretty freaky to see how 500 years ago they were doing something that we're trying to replicate today. 
In the port area of Genoa at that time, you had the workers, they were called camalli, and the camalli were already work, uh, wearing uh, jeans, denim garments. It was, as I said, worn by sailors and by people working in the port area. And in the 17th century, there was this painter, um, and he's called the master of blue jeans because he painted a whole series of, um, of portraits of people um, mainly poor people in the port area of Genoa, as you can see it on the right side. And they were wearing denim already. And that the, the really fascinating thing is that they were wearing it, obviously, till it was ripped into parts. So it looks really like stuff that we're actually producing and doing today. But we're talking about 300 years ago. Well, the thing with indigo is that uh, the whole battle between Wode and indigo was solved when Adolf von Bayer in... Um, 1865 invented um, synthetic indigo. So synthetic indigo allowed also to scale up the production of, uh, of jeans garments of, or denim fabric. And eventually that fabric made it to the States. Like historically speaking, at least according to our research, like through England, it landed in Baltimore. And from Baltimore, it was distributed throughout the States. And at that time, uh, there was... Um, there was a distributor of fabrics, uh, Levi Strauss, that together with a designer, Jacob Davis, they came up with this first uh, five pocket jean that they riveted in all those points that suffer um, the most distress. So basically they put rivets on the pockets, the fifth pocket uh, or coin pocket in the back pockets. So they really reinforced the work wear jean. So the gene was born definitely like in, uh, in San Francisco, and uh, I guess the rest is history. It's interesting to see like how uh, denim evolved and the jeans industry evolved from the States and then took over the States and then Europe and then uh, the whole world. And eventually, um, let's say in the, in the 50s, 60s, it, it came back strongly like also in the, in the fashion industry in Italy. And um, there's a very interesting video that I suggest you guys uh, watch on YouTube. It's called Common Thread. And um, a friend of ours, Scott Morrison, produced this, this film, basically, where he investigates the origins of, of denim, starting with Italy, but then he goes also to America, he goes also to Japan. And it's a, it's a great insight, uh, because you can see the places that I was talking about. You can see uh, the people who are still trying to keep that legacy going today. And, uh, and definitely an interesting thing is that it has evolved into something completely different. What we saw um, right now in the, in the 15th century was a very simple and strong workwear product, which today transformed into a very technological and sophisticated fabric because there is so much in there. Like if you follow Transformers, um, I'm sure that you get an idea of like how much technology, how much research, how much innovation is, is in a pair of jeans today. So it is really important to understand that and also to be able to, to work with that and, and be able also to communicate it further on. So thank you very much, guys, for listening. And uh, yeah, if you have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, there are some questions. Um, thank you so much. Oh, you're absolutely right. That Common Fred video, it, it, there's free, it's a series of it, even sort of like Alice, like Tornello features in one of them as well. And she'll be on with us tomorrow. Uh, that's a really good video to check. So thank you so much for that. We do have some questions. Let's just check. Yeah. Come through. Great presentation. Was there demand for the color blue or the color at all? Thank you. I think, yeah, the, the work wear blue color, that world color was very popular in Europe. And you, you've like documented yeah. that for us. Anything you want to add? add, this, add, this, add this. Well, to be honest, I, I, I can't really say exactly why it was the color blue, but like in my opinion, it's always related to um, how easy it is to grow something. And at that time, whoa, just like hemp, as you said before, it was something that would grow everywhere. Yeah. So once you figure out like how you can transform that into a fiber that you use to spin or you transform it into a powder that you can use to dye, you have a constant and easy supply which can uh, allow you to generate volumes and also keep the prices low. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think blue, from my understanding, most probably has uh, imposed itself like also for this reason. If there is a more poetic reason, I don't know, to be honest, but I would be yeah, well, I, like, I, fascinated I, I, to find out. I'm like you. It's like it just happened to be the available color 
It's the same with, Le- with Levi Strauss when they ended up picking natural indigo in their very first blue gene. Obviously, their very first dark gene was brown. But, but when they, you know, it was just the available color, just like copper rivets, it was just the available like, material that, that was there. So a lot of these workwear garments is about what is available locally when they start making these things. Um, let's just leave also, because copper, for example, copper, for example, is interesting because that's a material that you extract the way it is and you, you work it. Right. Mm-hmm. If you talk about brass, for example, that's a, a mix of metals. Right. So that came a little bit later, even if it's been like around forever. Right. So it's um, there, there are various reasons behind it, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, Terry, sure saying, also- Terry saying thank you. Barbara saying thank you. Annie saying thank you. Everyone's loving your presentation. Uh, uh, Somebody is asking here. Uh, um, Andrea is asking if it's correct to say that denims are from from the NIM. Um, as I said before, like there. It appeared like basically in, in, in both parts, in Genoa and in Nim at the yeah. same time. In Nim, it was um, also known they had big plantations of, of Indigo Fera, which in Genoa, being like a port, being like more by the coast, like wasn't that much possible. Um, it was the Serge de Nim was um, a, a, it was different as a fabric from, from the jean fabric, let's say from, from Genoa. But basically, like, I mean, it's, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's incorrect. I wouldn't say, I would say that at that time, like in that area, because like Genoa and Nim are actually very close at the same time. We're not talking about Genoa and um, Edinburgh. I mean, we're talking about two places that are uh, one beside another. And I'm sure that they had a lot of overlappings and uh, things happening at the same time there. So um, I think you should all go on the, on the, that's a, pla- that's a, that's a fun thing to do. You know, like, I mean, if you have time, if you're in Italy, just stop by at the museum in Chieri, go down to, to Genoa. Genoa is actually trying to rediscover its roots now. And they, they're about to launch this, this, uh, gene festival. And because they want to actually show all these things that they have, which they've never even, they never understood the real value of that. The tapis- tapestry that we saw before, for example, from 1500, uh, 1600, um, it's, it's something amazing for the denim community. I think they, they should see that. There are um, little figures of, I don't know what you call it, like the, at Christmas, when you make the Christmas tree, you have a little, cri- I don't know what you call it, like where you have like uh, Mother Mary and, and Joseph and like and all those guys, right? Um, they have these figures like from the 17th century wearing basically jeans. They have the gene of uh, Garibaldi, who was uh, like a very famous guy here in Italy. So there's there's a lot of things that they have to show. So it's it's pretty interesting to go dig into there. Like I, mean. well, I really appreciate the like European like perspective because everyone just thinks it starts with Levi Strauss and you know May 20th, 1873. No, there's a earlier history as well that, that actually you know helps. It, it, you know, so it's really great seeing it. Marlin's got a question for us. Will you, will you be going back to natural indigo and woad? I guess that's I guess that's a Candiani question. But, um, uh, excuse me, what is the question again? Uh, uh, will you be going back to natural indigo and woad? I guess it's a Candiani related uh, question, but yeah, regarding natural indigo and woad uh, dyeing. Marlin. Natural indigo and oh, what about going back to that? Right. Well, right. yeah, we well we have we have run several tests with woad. The thing is actually that. The, you cannot get a depth of color. You can get just a very light color. And um, at the end of the day, like we have obviously to, to please the, the designer brands with, with what we're doing and you're going very much out of it. We, it was really hard actually to restart a whole production around that because like, I mean, there is an industry laid out to work with Indigo. There is no industry laid out to work with Woad. So what we run was like test runs, like in very small quantities, the prices were ridiculous, obviously. So there's nobody who's interested in that. It's nice for the sake of research and for trial. And that's what we did. And natural indigo is definitely like a, a very hot topic. Also because like definitely there's a couple of things that you need to know about the use of natural indigo because natural indigo, first of all, you need tons of it, right? I mean, we have a, a lot, like, I mean, we're, um, in our production, if we run a dyeing lot, we dye, let's say, 50,000 meters of yarn in one hit. And to do that, you would need 10 football fields of indigo fera. Yeah, yeah. So That's is that sustainable? I don't know. And furthermore, like if you use, as I said before, indigo has a problem that it's, it's a very big molecule and it has a big problem to, it can't penetrate the cotton fiber. So it just dirties the fiber superficially and that's why it fades and that's the great thing about denim, right? But in order to make it stick to the fiber, you need chemicals. 
which is this big thing, you know, in, in, in the denim industry, water and chemicals. So on a traditional dyeing range, you need 10 times more chemicals to dye natural indigo than synthetic indigo. So unless you have like a, and that's what the industry is working at with different partners, unless you find a new technology that allows you to use the same amount of chemicals or less chemicals than, than the evolved technologies to dye natural indigo, uh, well, then there could be a future. Then there could be like, again, you know, a all natural way of using cool. elements. There and I think that would be pretty cool. Company, is it called Hue that have done that bacteria-based indigo that they presented at Transformers, the main Transformers about a year ago. So there are companies that are working in other natural indigo yeah. based uh, dyes. So Absolutely. Should... Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, Tinctorium, right? That's it. There we go. He was the old yeah. name. Yeah. Got it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they changed right. the name. I don't forgot which one they were going for. I've got two more questions quickly. Um, are you working with PCW and hemp? Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I know you are, but that's the question. And then great presentation, the future of color. Do you think we're going to be popular among customers for denim in sustainable context? Hmm, I don't really understand that question. The future of color, do you think we're going to be popular amongst consumers of denim in sustainable con context? I don't understand that question. Well, I, I understand. Maybe it means that are people going to walk away from indigo, maybe? Uh, oh, yeah. Because like, it's, it's hard to dye. It's, 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 it involves chemicals and, and indigo and everything. I, I think, you know, like, um, if you look at the data, um, jeans is the, is the most long-lasting trend in garment history and fashion industry. So I think it's like an evergreen that will always be there. Um, what the whole industry is trying to do, and um, again, I say follow transformers to get a glimpse of like how far technology and innovation can go today. Um, we're trying to actually make it happen to keep that aesthetic, but in a in a much uh, more environmental friendly uh, and responsible way. So this is the research that everybody's trying to do. Yeah, I think we're always going to have blue jeans just done in a more sustainable way. Uh, Andrew has asked a question about natural colored denim. Um, of course, there is there is a different. Well, you can have first of all, you can have denim also without indigo, which is a crew, which is I love it. Basically, it's not white. It's like the color of cotton. Uh, if you want white, then you have to bleach that to go to white. But you can have a crew denim, which is beautiful. Um, and then you can also dye it with, with natural colors, but then that's um, garment dyed. So we're not talking about denim anymore because denim, the actual definition would be yarn dyed in the warp and white weft. So it's a combination of two yarns where one is dyed. If you do garment dyed, you have a whole fabric that's white and you put it in a bath with color and the whole, the whole fabric becomes that color. What we're already doing, we're using uh, from, from our chroma, it's no, no secret, we're using earth colors, which are uh, sulfur colors that are made out of uh, waste products from the food industry or from the pharmaceutical industry, such as orange peels, nutshells, uh, beetroot peels. Uh, we even have a color that's custom made for us. It's called earth cotton. So it's made out of cotton uh, waste, cotton scraps that are transformed into a pigment. And we use that in our green cast range. So basically it's our it's like our yeah i just okay. said a secret maybe no, 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 no. thank you so much simon I if think they I fire me like i'm i'm gonna send you my cv Moses. oh no but guys if you've got any questions make sure you do reach out to, to simon he's, he's easily available you can find him on on like on like linkedin and stuff but thank you for your time that presentation was epic i'm so happy that our students got to see it and it's now recorded so thank you so much for that simon. thank you very much guys uh it's it's okay. fantastic what you guys are doing so i'm glad to to be here and to to do my part. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your time.